Okay. okay. So we're going to stop this now. So what you saw was, have we started the recording? Yeah. Okay. So what you saw was the double line capital trading room in the beginning of the interview. That's a small trading group because they are a focused bond, uh, bond fund manager. They are actually what they're a traditional asset management kind of model. Most of their funds are. So basically they're long, long only in uh, bonds. Okay. So they manage various types of bonds. So very successful bond fund. It's more than 100 billion under management. So, and so you should read his analysis. So here I'm showing you the, uh, so that's a, that was a fairly small trading room. This is an example of a very big trading room. This is the UBS trading. This is in 2008. This is the UBS trading room in Stamford, Connecticut. You can see how big it is. So here you can see, if you remember, if you go back to what I showed you here, remember I showed you when I, uh, this note is, uh, this is in your notes. If you look at, um, this why have I put market making operations together in one instead of just putting into something like uh, you know investment banking investment banking is kept pure as a capital raising activity okay many people would call this an investment bank but actually that's the correct functional term would be most of these people are market makers so where are the market making okay yeah so these broker dealer uh, broker dealers and market makers who are acting as principal you understand the difference between principal and agent right principal and agent you understand yes a person who's selling his house if Bharat is selling his house to Ritesh and he's going through a broker say Mehak is the broker then Mehak is acting as an agent for Bharat if Bharat has engaged him her to sell the house and she goes around and catches hold of Ritesh and tries to sell him the house so she's acting as an agent on behalf of uh, she's representing Bharat who is the principal and Ritesh and Bharat are the two principals in this case okay so that's the difference so you should understand this really is part of the theory of contract so there's a branch of the theory of contract which deals with the theory of agency so this theory of agency deals with the relationships between the agent and the principal okay what representation and in what ways the agent can bind the principal and all that right so I might have given you this example when we went to um, remember when we were doing contract law I, I might have discussed uh, Roger Federer's and its agent I might have discussed this case so if Federer has a sports agent who has who is known to everyone as Federer sports agent so that sports agent can actually bind Federer into a contract uh, you know to a contract without consulting Federer on the details because he's a sports agent Federer has made it known to the world that he's the sports agent so he can get into a deal with Uniqlo which is that new 30 million dollar deal that he did okay without getting into the specifics and Federer is, be, uh, is, uh, is going to be bound by that because uh, he's a sports agent so sports agent what that's what they do they negotiate contracts on the on behalf of their principles okay so therefore uh, if, if an agent is acting in a way that is consistent with what that kind of agent is normally supposed to do are you following the principle understand the principle then I'll give you an example of where he's not bound so if Federer's agent signs a deal with Uniqlo without discussing the terms with Federer Federer is still bound because that's what sports agents do and he has made it known to the world that this is my sports agent this is clear but if uh, Federer's agent, sports agent, signs a deal where he is compelling, where he is uh, binding Federer to, uh, where he say, let's say Federer, Federer is agreeing to invest 100 million dollars in a uh, construction project off the coast of Malaysia, that for that Federer will not be bound, because that is not the normal work of a sports agent. Are you following the principle here? So any the theory of agency, you need to understand that concept that the theory of agency, the agent can bind the principle. OK, so if, if uh, Mehak has uh, been appointed as an agent, she has the authority to agree the terms of the house. OK, she, she can basically uh, so she will be able to negotiate those kinds of deal related to deals related to the selling of the house. But she can't get into other kinds of transactions. So the point is that basically the normal, the implied authority of an agent applies in a setting where, uh, you know, where uh, where the agent is functioning within the normal bounds of his uh, area of operations. So the sports agent can tie him into a sports deal, but he can't bind Federer into a real estate investment deal because that's not the domain of a sports agent's negotiations. This is principle clear. You should remember this. So when we say market makers, now this thing here you can see I've already discussed with you market makers. When you look at a market making operation, this is the reason I put it here like this. So these market makers, this this function that people perform in the financial sector, 
when you have market makers and broker dealers broker dealers uh, bd is broker dealers or just plain dealers they are basically uh, these broker dealers are actually acting as uh, you know when they are acting so here i've talked about the agency broker these are acting as agents okay so these guys are acting as agents so they arrange deals between parties but what you see here in this trading room on this trading room floor most of the most of the traders here most of the operations here would be i guess about 80 to 90 percent of the operations would be market making operations so remember what i told you in market making operation you have three parts traders what else a typical market making operation has what kinds of uh, uh, players in yes <laughs> research right so sales trading and research you should remember these terms if you're graduating as a finance student sales trading and research it's already in your notes i've already discussed it in detail with all the different types of roles okay so in a typical market or a typical large trading floor of a of a bank like this of a ubs is a universal bank from uh, switzerland so you'll see on a typical bank trading floor like this you'll see most of the operations are actually market making operations so in here you see people who are uh, traders, salespeople, and researchers all are together. Okay, all together working as one team. The salespeople are trying to drum up business, calling clients, and the researchers are producing research to uh, induce the clients to trade. And the traders are eating up all that volume because remember, market makers want high volume. So these two other support functions are generating the volume for the market makers. And obviously, the market makers have to carry some risk as well. Just like you see here, when you're when you're making markets, in this case, you see. Uh, in this case, you see that uh, a company running a business, okay, of um, you know mining gold, copper, oil, etc., exploring oil, has to carry some inventory on its books because that's how big businesses function. <laughs> Similarly, when you look at a market maker's book, if a market maker is making markets in all these kinds of instruments, okay, when at any point of time when you look at a market maker's book in the course of an active trading day, it's unlikely to be square. It's unlikely to be flat. There'll be some positions because everything is not evenly balanced. It's not like somebody comes and sells 10 units and immediately somebody comes and buys 10, uh, 10 units. So you're not going to have, so there's going to be a disbalance. So anytime you look at the uh, market makers books, you will see some kind of position, long short, whatever. Okay. So uh, that's what happens. So they, the market maker, the trading desk will also have to manage the risk of those positions. Okay. So they have to watch uh, as what, uh, uh, you know, the, what they have to watch the markets and take decisions on what to do with your positions and if they, especially the markets are moving. So uh, these are the things that they have to. So typically you can see here, you get an example of a large trading room and this, you have to imagine this as about 80 to 90% will be market making. Some of it will be what we would call directional speculation. Okay. Those are called proprietary trading operations or sometimes you might have heard this term called prop trading prop is for proprietary there is basically those are basically people speculating with the bank's capital just like you did your two projects where you speculated with that one million dollar capital given to you by ib you were speculating on u.s equity options and you were speculating on u.s on indian uh, cash equities okay so that's the kind of stuff that the uh, prop trading desk would be doing with the uh, bank capital but that has become very uh, very very limited now in scope because of all kinds of restrictions especially after the financial crisis in, in general in any big trading room most of it is actually going to be a market making operation so this is basically for your idea of uh, uh, what a trading room looks like and just to refresh your memory so you can see how basic stuff like the components of a market making operation which is an important conceptual understanding everyone has forgotten right except for she remembered one part of it Okay, so you have to remember how a market making, how the business functions. All right, so we go back to our discussion of our uh, case. All right, we see. Okay. All right, so um, what were we discussing yesterday? We discussed mainly hedging with euro dollar futures, right? So has everyone understood what we were doing yesterday? So the main concept that we have, the new concept we introduced yesterday is how the hedge position acts as a uh, offset for the underlying position so the process you can go back and listen to the the discussion once again okay so you have to think of it this way and all the material is actually in your notes or in between your i put the project brief also in your notes so what we will do today is we'll continue with the uh, idea we'll just refresh this idea once again and uh, try to um, so i'll just briefly first go through your notes and refresh the concepts um, this is the case. This is the project brief.
this is a technical one okay so if we go here I'll just quickly refresh once again this stuff is all basic stuff you already are aware of uh, definitions and taxonomy risk books types of underlying position key risk factors okay let's start from here hedge transaction hedge position so here you can see okay so the important point which is already there in the video from yesterday because Bharat asked a question after the class in response to which I clarified this but this is also in your notes that the objective of hedging the object when you are running this time you're going to be running a hedge, hedge book right so to offset the underlying position risks on the uh, on a passive risk book which is there for a mining company a mining and exploration company so you are going to have you need to have a very good understanding philosophically of what hedging is about so the objective of hedging is not to make money it is actually to reduce risk okay so to be objective here as you can see you want to bring certainty to cash flows so if you listen to the end of the discussion so obviously if the video if I'm continuing the video that means uh, there's a technical question which has been asked so that is also part of your learning okay that you have to listen to that as well so um, when you see this so the objective is to bring certainty to cash flow so the lock in basic lock in uh, your net realization so if you take this as an example if you just I'll just quickly uh, do this one more time we uh, here so if we have gold here if I'm worried like I have some long inventory in, I have some inventory in gold which is a long position I have an underlying position which is long in gold and I look at the gold market and let's assume that I come to a view uh, that uh, this price is now likely to collapse to 1200 okay so I'm very concerned that it will collapse right away so what I do I just give you a simplistic example I look at the total position that I have to hedge what is the total position that I have I have how much 2500 troy ounces okay this is the position right this is the position that we have so I have 2500 troy ounces of gold so then what I'll do is immediately I'm gonna sell 2500 ounces here okay so I'm gonna actually I'm using this chart which is a spot gold chart so that's what we would typically do uh, to use a spot chart to form the views but then eventually when I have to trade I know that in this constraint uh, in this particular project I'm constrained to using gold futures contracts for hedging not spot contracts okay so spot contracts are OTC futures contracts are exchange traded and so therefore I would go and use it against the so let's say Feb, Feb 26 so again ideally what I would do is I would go to the CME web page okay I would go to the CME web page and um, go to the gold page go to gold this is all under uh, oh, these are all interest rate contracts because we were looking at uh, interest uh, 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 this interest rate category but anyway you go to the main page go to it uh, in the case of gold you go to metals then you call up the gold contract right and then you see what the volume is right just like here you would see here you can see here what the volume is why is this being blanked out okay it's a little bigger right so you can see what the volume is here that the volume is highest in this part okay so in this say, same way you would look at the gold contract with the highest volume okay then later on we'll tell you how to look at open interest also but in general at the moment you can work on which contract should I select you can select the one with the highest volume right but you have to also keep an eye on remember you have to keep an eye on expiration dates you have to remember all those things the gold contract you have to see whether each contract you have to be aware whether the contract is financially settled if it is financially settled then you don't have this concern about getting out before the first notice date or the last trading date whichever is earlier but if it's a physically settled contract like crude oil then you need to keep an eye on that so this project is meant to teach you all those uh, uh, tricks so that you are aware that you should be able to go through the so the steps that you're learning is essentially this the so the main learning and in, in this is uh, in on this aspect is that you should be aware if it's financially settled or physically settled if it's physically settled then you need to be careful about getting out of the position any position that you have if you're long especially if you're long you you have to get out before the first notice date or the last trading date whichever is earlier please read your futures notes this is all explained why you need to do that otherwise you could get delivered 
right so there is a note in your book i've referred you to the textbook also <coughs> there's a note about how a guy gets ends up ends up with cattle futures and he has to go to a place and actually participate in a cattle auction and stay there for a week and end up selling the cattle in physical cattle in the cattle auction because he got physically delivered okay instead of closing the position they bought another contract so all these nuances you have to go through so the idea here in this project is to make you go through these steps so that the learning gets uh, programmed into your uh, head okay so it's not so much that you have to remember whether euro dollar futures are physically settled or not but you should remember the logic you need to remember what is the checklist that you have to go through right are you following what i'm saying okay so you will find out this and in this case you have to uh, let's say we selected the december contract it has high volume all right so we look at the december contract okay this here we the december contract okay so you can sell this so if i sell this here at 1473 all right and then uh, i would essentially what the result of that is that i have locked in now if we go back to the chart you can see what is happening if i sell it now at this price 1473 then if the market drops after that in one instant it drops let's say to take an extreme example it drops to 1200 okay what is going to happen is my uh, assets are going to lose value here the gold inventory will drop in value from 1473 to 1200 all right so it will be reflected into 12 2500 but because i've sold 2500 contracts here so i will also make money on those 2000 contracts i sold as a hedge as a hedge transaction okay are you following the logic so the hedge transaction will act as an offset so on my hedge positions i'll have my hedge position pnl will be 2500 into 1473 minus 1200 and my underlying that is plus and on the underlying position there'll be a minus pnl of the same <coughs> magnitude are you following so effectively what that means is when I, at whatever price you hedge at whatever price you hedge so the learning here is this that at whatever price you hedge you have locked in that realization for your underlying position which means the value of your underlying position has now been locked in at 1473 whatever the price it is that you hedge at that's the le learning here are you following yeah okay so uh, then uh, what we have is uh what are we doing here okay so is this the first important thing to understand is that you have locked in this real life. no matter what happens no matter what happens you will lose uh, you will not lose any more money your all your realization has been locked in at 1473 is this is clear okay so we'll have to deduct marks for her also now we'll at least since we have a rule that we okay so hedge positions all right we are studying hedge positions all right yeah we're in this okay all right so now understand this that why is it locked in now even if after you sell let's say you sell the entire amount 2500 ounces even after that if it shoots up to say 1600 dollars if the gold price if your view is wrong and the gold price shoots up to 1600 dollars you are still locked in at 1475 1473 at whatever price because if it shoots up now what will happen is the underlying position shows a profit because the underlying position is long right the underlying position is long yeah so the underlying position is long so when the price shoots up from 1473 to 15 1600 that amount is shown as a profit on the underlying position but on the hedge position what you have because you went short here so the hedge position is going to have a loss yes, yes the hedge position will have a loss <coughs> same amount of the loss yes. the quantum of gain on the underlying position is offset by the quantum of loss on the hedge position because so that again once again shows to you that uh, what the net result of hedging the entire amount at this particular price x okay which is say 1473 at that hedging at that price locks in the uh, inventory valuation at that price no matter what happens to the market whether it goes up or down your net realization is locked in at the price at which you hedged is this clear this mechanism should be clearly understood by everyone okay so obviously you don't in this particular project you don't have to hedge uh, uh, everything in one go it depends on the strength of your view whatever your plan is okay maybe you feel that uh, you want to get some insurance so you want to sell maybe 500 ounces that is for you to decide how much you want to hedge at any point of time but essentially this is what you have to do in your project you have to look at the key KRF markets and you have to be aware of your underlying position 
then take a view on the market if you feel obviously if you feel that now before you have done your hedge transaction when you only have the underlying position okay uh, what we illustrated just now is the fact that your uh, hedge transaction price uh, the uh, the underlying asset valuation is locked in at the hedge transaction price okay so uh, we can actually write that down because that's an important principle um, that the underlying underlying position realization everybody understands price realization underlying position price realization uh, net price let's call it net price realization this is just writing down what we have already discussed just now just to show you that it's locked in so the underlying position net price realization is or uh, actually this is not well worded we can word it a little better the net net price realization on the underlying position is locked in at hedge transaction price okay so obviously here i'm not writing that part it's assuming that you have hedge the underlying entire underlying position if you have an underlying position of 2500 units and you hedge only uh, you hedge only um, 500 units then this statement applies only to the 500 units is that clear to everyone yes kanika are you following your whatsapp says this okay so uh, is is that clear this is the principle that we have just illustrated yes. okay and so obviously if you had only 500 ounces it applies only to 500 ounces and the rest are still exposed so 2500 is still exposed if the price collapses dramatically then that you will find you will experience losses on the 2005 so this is how you're going to proceed is this clear now to for for all the asset classes there's no difference in principle sorry transaction and the underlying transaction no 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 one, one, one minute why should the hedging the underlying transaction you don't do anything because you are already there yes. see the way it works is you have basically you have the underlying uh, you have the business right so when you are coming in as a hedge team okay when you are coming in as a hedging team you are already faced with this passive risk book you're already faced with this passive risk book right you come to the business and you see that as the treasury manager the business has these risks you look at the balance sheet of the business and you see that the business has these risks because it's got inventories in in uh, commodities which are actively traded so the market price is being continuously set and reset and it can go anywhere so there is a risk on account of that that's other kid so that's why i said when you first come to manage a risk book whether it's an active or passive risk book you will have to first assess uh, uh, identify the krfs okay and identify the underlying position in each of the krf markets which is what we have done so far in this case so you don't have to do anything about the underlying positions you are faced with the you are given the underlying positions okay it's almost like a kind of a in a loose way like an exogenous variable it's given to you you are faced with this now you have to manage it by building up a portfolio of hedge positions we can call that a hedge book okay the hedge book consists of all the hedge positions now you have to build up a hedge book in a, a caref, uh, in a careful way which based on your market views the and the objective of your hedge positions is that they should be put on in such a way with such timing that if they there is any loss on the underlying position that is offset by the gain on the hedge position is this clear everyone follows right okay so this is the idea okay i'm not getting enough uh, uh, you know affirmative responses yes so uh, so only you're clear okay faces are actually kind of blank so <laughs> i'm getting a little concerned whether people have understood or not okay so uh, kushbu what is your whatsapp saying is it clear or not yes okay all right yeah do we don't have the mic today no sir. okay all right okay so if we do a contract we send the are in lots so uh, for example if we have to purchase 2500 lots of futures uh, at one go and uh, on the other hand we have the maintenance of gold uh, of 500 then uh, the rest 2000 Like no, no. First of all, purchase is not uh, relevant in the case of the gold position for this case, because here the underlying position is 
what? You go short. Point yeah, you want to go short. If, uh, on the hedge transactions, you want to be selling. Okay. But uh, so, but the point is, so what are you saying? So, I'm saying that since the lots are of greater value than the inventories actually have. No, but that's not the case in this case. What, what the the case has been the case has been designed in such a way that the underlying position sizes are round multiples of the contract sizes. So in this case, the gold contract size is how much? What is the size? Anybody remembers? 100 ounces. The CME futures, the CME futures contract on gold, which is a COMEX futures contract. A COMEX is a division of CME. It used to be an independent exchange. It got bought over by the CME. So uh, uh, this, uh, the COMEX gold futures contract is the contract sizes. You can go and check it on the website. It's 100 ounces. So this position size that I put on your underlying position that's why you see this very unnatural kind of balance sheet size very few businesses have such a small balance sheet right why is it so small because we are constrained by our capital requirements and the underlying position sizes have been crafted deliberately put in such a way that the uh, these will be round multiples of the CME contract sizes which you are going to use for hedging so that if you want you can go to 100% hedged you can go to 100% hedge profile that means your underlying position will be long 625k and your hedge book will show minus 625k for copper if you want you can do that so it is a round multiple of the contract size so you will not have that position in this case you won't have that problem in this case okay but if you do have a problem okay typically the problem will be on the other side in a normal business which is going to be very big okay so the contract sizes will be much smaller than the total underlying position exposure and the actual problem that you might face is that the uh, underlying position size is not a round multiple of the contract size so your inventory might be 2579 okay so that 79 uh, is an odd amount that 79 troy ounces will be an odd amount because you don't have a 79 ounces contract on the CME. It's 100 ounces. So either you decide to over hedge by selling 100 ounces or sell, selling 2600 ounces or you decide to under hedge by selling 2500 ounces. Okay, in any case, it will not matter very much because you don't have to necessarily be 100% hedge. Even if you're like 95, 90 uh, percent, you are basically taken care of catastrophic risk. Okay, remember that if we go back to the uh, hedge, hedge note, what are we talking about? This is a very important principle to understand because many actively traded, even publicly traded corporations, I've heard reports about Indian IT companies where the foreign exchange risk management is not being done in a systematic and a structured manner. Okay, so you remember how structured uh, how tr structured the risk management plan should be for what I've taught you even for active risk books, even for speculative books, I've told you to manage risk in a very tight manner by planning out your total loss and all that. So it is not being done even for a hedging for a hedge book, it was not being done in a systematic manner for publicly traded Indian IT companies. All right. So therefore, it's very important. So uh, it's very important to uh, make sure that you understand these principles, that the purpose of hedging is to bring certainty to future cash flows okay so it's a very conservative approach all right so what was i saying here mm, yeah so the idea of catastrophic risk you understand what catastrophic risk is catastrophic risk is basically you know you know what a catastrophe is you know disaster it's like a huge disaster it's an unmitigated disaster okay so you can think of maybe the fukushima re reactor as a catastrophe or something the fukushima accident as a catastrophe or a major earthquake as a catastrophe okay so therefore in fact there are in the bond markets you have actually things called cat bonds if you have cat bonds these are not like cats and dogs this cat is actually a short for catastrophe okay so those bonds are their payouts are connected to major catastrophic events okay like uh, hurricanes earthquakes other kinds of problems so catastrophic risk is basically almost the kind of risk that completely destroys the company so if you want to understand what catastrophic risk is we can just go and call up let's say the oil price and we can go up to our um, your um, uh, a long-term chart of the oil price and if we go to say weekly hopefully 
So if you remember, uh, you won't remember obviously, but I remember that when this oil price this went up to 147.47 on the crude oil price, which that which is now 58. Okay, this price went up to 147.47 around leading up to the financial crisis. So at this time, if you were looking at the last few, uh, you know, several months, many small regional airlines were going bankrupt because airlines essentially, if you see an airline profile, a PNL profile, the uh, their operating cost about 50% of the operating cost is uh, fuel cost for an airline. And if many airlines were not hedged, uh, this shows you the importance of hedging. Okay, so the objective of hedging is to make sure that the company survives. Remember, I showed you that framework where you had uh, risk reduction on one side and uh, risk increasing risk and growing earnings on one side. So on the risk reduction side, that's where risk management comes in. That you're trying to make, make sure you reduce risk so that you stay solvent. Remember, solvency is one of the goals. That one of the goals is you have to increase uh, earnings. And the other goal is that you have to remain solvent. You should not go under, should not become bankrupt, right? So what happened is a lot of small regional airlines went bankrupt as the oil price started shooting up because nobody had planned for $100 plus oil prices. These guys had not planned for it and they hadn't hedged. Like our uh, economic advisor when prices were around 35 or something, he said, uh, Arvind Subramaniam, he said actually that oil prices won't go above $45. Okay. And very soon it was up at $75, $80. That's why you should not, only a person who has no experience of trading in markets would make statements like that. Okay. These are very irresponsible statements. Uh, pretending that if, as if you understand everything is very cool, you understand everything is under your control, you can actually make a statement like that. There's no basis for anyone to make a statement like that because nobody actually knows what will happen in the markets so the right right perspective is to understand that nobody really knows what can happen and anything can happen that is the right way to look at markets so anyway so the point is that this is what you call catastrophic risk so many small regional airlines who had not hedged their oil prices or oil price exposure they were all um, they all went bankrupt because they couldn't handle the uh, oil uh, the input cost increases and in a competitive market you can't always pass on the price to the consumer because there are many other airlines some of whom may have hedged so they were able to operate at the same prices at the market price are you able to follow the dynamic yes. that your input costs are going up dramatically you're paying more and more for your oil cash flow is being drained and then you're not making enough from ticket sales so your profit at some point you can't meet your normal trade debts because you don't have enough cash you're not generating enough cash flow so basically you go bankrupt so this is what is called catastrophic risk so the objective of a hedging program is to protect against the company against these catastrophic risks the reason i came to this term is that based on Mayhew's question that uh, you don't necessarily have to go 100 percent hedge but if you're kind of like 90 95 percent hedge you would would have anyway prevented catastrophic risk okay because so the uh, so you don't always have to be 100 percent hedge but in this project you can be 100 percent hedged so here now let's say on while we are discussing this let's ask kanika what is an airline's underlying position with respect to Actually, what they use is jet fuel, okay, that is kerosene. It's a kerosene kind of product. Jet fuel uh, is like a chemical comp composition like kerosene. But let's assume they use crude oil because it comes out of crude oil. You put the crude oil into a refinery and you refine on this all these distillation processes and then all kinds of products come out. Gasoline, then uh, kerosene, this, that, at different temperatures, all the different uh, products come out. But let's assume that they use crude oil, okay, because they're just using a downstream product. Like instead of using yogurt, you're using milk. Okay, you make something with yogurt, but yogurt prices will depend on milk prices, right? So therefore, we assume that instead of using yogurt, they're using milk. So we assume that they're using crude oil as an input. So now tell us for any airline, okay, say for Indigo, what is the underlying position with respect to crude oil? Short if the market goes up, that's your answer. And long if the market goes down. Why is your answer phrased like that? My question was, what is an what is an what is Indigo's under, underlying position with respect to crude oil? And your answer is short if the market goes up. Okay, now you're saying short. Okay, one minute. Be quiet, guys. Be quiet. Now explain why you are saying short. So Indigo's underlying position with respect to crude oil, her answer is short. Now explain why 
Why are you right? Say Chug is uh, disagreeing with you. How will you? What will you say to him? I'm just assuming here that. So how will you defend your answer? Quiet. Yes. Should be pretty simple. One minute. You have many defenders who have cropped up at the back. Many people willing to defend. You are willing to defend her answer. You are contesting it. You are defending the answer. Yes, Mayak, you want to contest her answer, or you agree with her? Okay, okay. Then you defend her. <laughs> one minute. One minute. So Mayak also thinks it's short. Now one minute. Quiet. Quiet, please. Okay. If I see anybody talking now, I'll have to deduct marks. Okay. Now, uh, <coughs> what is the what is the defense? You're saying it's short. No, I'm saying it's no, it's long. Now, what will you say? How will you defend yourself? How will you justify your answer? Is my question clear? What logic will you give to justify your answer? Uh, when the market is going up, uh, we lose money, and when the market is going down, we make money. Okay. And uh, similarly, if uh, we spend, uh, similarly, uh, if a pork crude oil, when the market will go down, they will. Uh, one minute, one minute. Let her complete. Yeah. When the market is going up, uh, they will uh, lose money, and the market. Who is they? Uh, okay. And then the market is going down, they will make money. Okay. Because, uh, Why will they make money when the market drops? So, because it is linked to their business and uh, fuel cost will be lower for them. Okay, okay, fine. So, the input cost will go down. Is that so, that is the correct justification. Now, you understand? Okay. So, now we at least we can see that some of you have understood the concept of underlying position. Okay. So, we have tested this concept that now. So, essentially, because these guys should have all bought crude oil futures. So, now actually, I should have asked this as a question. So, if your underlying position is short, what should be your hedge transaction when you decide that it's time to hedge? Of course, what you're doing is you're monitoring the crude oil market. So, the hedging team in an airline, a big airline, like uh, the one very, uh, very successful airline, uh, it's a medium sized airline called Ryanair. Have you heard of Ryanair? Yes. Ryanair is an Irish airline, actually. They're very successful in the EU. Uh, Ryanair hedges their uh, oil up to five years they head up to five years okay you will see lots of interviews of um, the, the the CEO of Ryanair he keeps talking about the hedging program how far they hedge whether they are putting on fresh edges okay so these are very important so hedging of oil price risk is very important for airlines okay because it's a life and death matter for them if oil prices shoot up for some reason they are in they are basically they might just be disappear they might just disappear so so hedging so what the hedging team in an airline will do is they will be monitoring crude oil prices and if they feel that crude oil prices are about to shoot up like this what are they going to do what hedge what hedge transaction will they do ritesh so they will so they will hedge uh, let's assume that they have to trade in crude oil futures they are being forced to trade in crude oil futures which is what you would do that's the most efficient way to trade crude oil okay very very liquid market you can get in on you don't trade physical cargoes to hedge okay because that's much more uh, difficult to execute much more messy so uh, therefore you, when you want to trade crude oil quickly you want to bet on crude oil prices very quickly you do it through the futures markets most liquid avenue so if they are doing that the hedging team now they have taken a view on the crude oil market and they are afraid that this market is going to shoot up and you're managing risk for crude oil risk for Ryanair so what will you do now what's your gonna what's gonna be your hedge transaction they will, buy. they will buy right so you will buy crude oil futures so your hedge transaction will be a purchase of crude oil futures this is right so you will again manif uh, manage your view and you'll see how uh, how apprehensive you are you might hedge the whole position or you might hedge a big chunk of it maybe 40 50 50 percent of your exposure you might hedge and then you have to also have to take views on how many years you're hedging for okay so like Ryanair hedges for five years many airlines don't hedge for that long they hedge for one or two years so that's a view that the company does that's a company policy issue that's a risk management policy matter okay how many years are you going to be hedging for all right so you will be hedging for in that case you're you're going to multiply your underlying position you are basically going to project all your purchases for the next five years because you assume that you're going to keep on operating so you know how much you're buying every month 
right you know how much you're buying every month so you will project that monthly purchases and then you will uh, attach them to these contracts so you can see here this is a Jan contract if you launch an options uh, thing you'll see the other contracts hopefully um, if we launch this or you can just go to the CME website and see all the other contracts so you will buy contracts according to your profile right so if you are buying some stuff in let's say uh, if you are buying some stuff some if there's a requirement of let's say 500 barrels in uh, say September 2020 then you'll try to find the contract nearest to September 2020 and uh, then you'll buy that okay if we reduce this and maybe we have uh, operating well but anyway you can see uh, if you go to the crude oil uh, you can go to the crude oil futures page on um, the CME web page on the CME website and uh, you can see all the different months trading so the way you would work is you would project the purchases for each position uh, for each month and then you would buy against the, uh, the finder contract which is nearest to that uh, period of time and then you would buy those futures contracts. So you would actually buy a head. If you are hedging for the entire five-year period, then you will be buying a string of futures contracts. Are you following? Okay. You would buy some for this Jan 2020, and uh, then you will buy some for the June contract, some for the September contract. In this way, you will buy a string of contracts relating to all the periods where you are. So you are actually making a projection for your underlying position in each month. Is everyone following what has to be done in a corporate treasury how you would hedge okay so this is the idea this gives you the idea of catastrophic risk so you see a real example in the run-up to 147 plus on the crude oil price many regional airlines went bankrupt because this is what is called catastrophic risk because they hadn't hedged their crude oil price risk okay so uh, we come back so that that's what this idea is here right that hedge uh, you can read all this later on this already we have discussed hedge transaction okay so this is the thing that this you already understand the logic we discussed yesterday the hedge transaction has to be such that it creates a opposite hedge position so whatever the underlying position is after your hedge transaction the resulting hedge position should be opposite so that it acts as an offset yes okay so there was a concept for an option like compounding options there is no such thing as compounding or many people got that wrong the answer actually the pro concept is compound options compound options. compound options is nothing but an option or an option is there anything like uh, hedging on the hedging transaction okay so this is the other part that Bharat was talking about we will discuss it on the uh, we'll get to that point okay what Bharat is actually going to is we have discussed it yesterday also in the video towards the end uh, after the class when Bharat was asking this question okay this this is the, uh, the topic that he's going to is called uh, static versus dynamic hedging programs okay so first I'm explaining ex explaining essentially we want to keep it simple so first I'm explaining uh, explaining what is a static hedging program right so which means once you hedge you forget about it okay the idea behind the static hedging program this is all there in your notes one of your modules is if you go further down basis risk I think it's at the end yeah types of hedging programs okay so you have static hedging programs since Bharat has asked the question we can maybe go into that okay we can address this point here where well, this is also open to you in this project you are allowed to run a dynamic hedging program that is your choice so even so this again is a matter of corporate treasury risk management policy this is something the company has to decide okay in conjunction with the in discussion with the board and all that so we will try to understand uh, at this point does everybody understand the difference between static and dynamic yes or no yes. everyone understands okay so Kushbu tell us what is the difference between a static hedging program and a dynamic first describe a static hedging program then describe a dynamic hedging program so we can work with the example of uh, once again we can work with the example of the crude oil and the airline okay where um, or let's let's take the example that uh, let's go back to the uh, case itself so that it, it's something that you can easily relate to okay so we go back to the discussion of our case where our underlying position in crude oil is long okay our underlying position in crude oil is long and so let's assume that I'm going to set up the stage for you so uh, the crude oil position is long 25,000 barrels okay you form a view on the crude oil market and uh, we you, you let's let's make this a little wider here so we can see a little bit more okay 
so you form a very bearish view on the crude oil market and you decide and we are going to for the sake of simplicity we are going to discuss everything on the assumption that whenever we hedge okay we hedge the whole position okay you can just uh, sort of adjust it for when you are if you are not hedging 100% you are hedging 40% for the same principle supply so for our discussions we are going to assume that whenever we hedge we are hedging the whole position to keep it simple so uh, let's assume that you have a very bearish view on the crude oil price and so you've sold the entire 25 uh, how many barrels do we have 25000 barrels okay so in our entire 25000 barrels you have sold essentially which means you have sold how many contracts 25 contracts because each contract is a thousand barrels in crude oil all right so you have sold 25 contracts so you so go short 25 contracts and because your view is this price is immediately going to drop to below 30 but after you sell so which means you have locked in your exposure at 5882 okay at this price we'll take the chart price instead of the fuel although actually what you'll have to do is you'll have to use the futures contract so it's 5884 well, let's say 5880 right so this is where the price is right now so you have sold okay <coughs> you have a bearish view on the underlying and you have sold 5880 at 5880 you sold the entire uh, 25 contracts okay but now instead of your view being right it turns out that your view is wrong market starts rising goes above this high goes above this high and very soon within two three days the market is now trading at seventy dollars okay now suppose based on this kind of movement because this high has also been broken maybe your when you take remember what i taught, taught you in the very beginning from ipm itself that whenever you take a view on the market you should also identify a point is a very good so i mean it's a it's a way to be very disciplined about your view taking because many professionals also uh, talk in a very airy fairy manner they just say the market is bullish i'm very bullish on the stock but they don't identify a level uh, below which they will lose their bullishness or they will sacrifice the view or they will surrender the view they don't identify a point right you understand what i'm saying yes. right so i've taught you this basic discipline uh, which will force you to be much more uh, rigorous in your analysis that whenever you take a view on a market okay always look at a chart you might use fa even if you use fa you still look at a chart because you should have some kind of basic discipline because the markets can move in huge uh, you know you can have like all this movement happen in the oil crude oil price just based on fears and expectations there was nothing happening in the underlying crude oil market like production supply disruption or excess supply nothing no news came no fundamental news came it's just market for us participants sentiment turned very bearish okay and the price collapsed and so it's actually in the oil market is a very good example of a market and pretty much in every liquid market this will happen it's actually the futures market which sets the oil price russia or saudi arabia or us okay us is now just very recently last week became the biggest producer of uh, of crude oil also they had already become the biggest energy producer if you take crude oil gas together they are bigger now than uh, uh, than russia and saudi the us is the biggest energy producer in the world this is all because of because after trump came in he introduced a lot of deregulation and a lot of uh, you know lands were opened up so he re actively deregulated in every sector of the business uh, of our business and uh, he also set up a lot of new exploration areas for crude oil so his goal was basically his goal was energy independence so that's why he went went after it like that okay so uh, so that's why now so so the point is um, so what did i okay so the point is not the us not russia not not uh, saudi arabia nobody sets the oil price the oil price is actually set by the futures market all right the oil price is set by the futures market what happened you are also going out or she has gone out and she has disappeared she's not even come back why are you going out so but i've told you guys that if you go out i'll have to deduct marks okay because there needs to be some discipline now she has disappeared i don't know where she has gone all right okay so come back to this so what i've told you guys is so so nobody sets the oil price no big producer sets the oil price the oil price is essentially set by the futures market because it's a very liquid market very speculative and there's so much uh, you know whenever you have a bearish view on something uh, the easiest way to give effect to your view that is the easiest way to express your view with a transaction instead of just talking right the reason i pay so much importance give so much importance to market prices is market prices means people are when you trade in the market you are actually taking risk which means you are putting your money where your mouth is right 
like all these people who criticize okay say whatever policy right some this uh, demonetization good bad whether you're saying good or bad you're not really taking any risk you're just shooting your mouth off okay and most of the people i find that those who are saying good they are all supporters of modi and those who are saying bad they are all anti modi anyway all the time so i have no credit none of this stuff has any credibility okay so if i had to look at the effect of demonetization i would look at the stock market because the stock market is real money people who are buying and selling in the lock they are not basically shooting their mouth off they are actually putting their money on the line they are taking risk and their combined risk taking buying selling is pushing prices up or down whatever it is so how the stock market reacts has much more <coughs> any market price has tremendous value because it represents real money people putting risk risk capital on the line not people just talking right so whenever you take a, uh, so it's they who drive the the market drives the uh, crude oil price okay the futures because the futures are so liquid whenever you have a view the fastest way to give effect to the view is go and hit the futures market rather than try and buy some new cargo of oil or get some more oil out of the ground or something like that or shut down a refinery or something all of that stuff takes time here is a few clicks you can sell thousands of contracts in a few clicks and you uh, you've given you have already taken a position based on your view this is clear okay so the futures market drives it so what i've told you guys is to be disciplined whenever you take a view even if it's an fa view look at the chart and identify some point on the chart at which you are going to call it quits that if the market moves so if your view here is bearish you should have of course you should have a, some kind of idea as to where you expect this to go but more importantly you should have some kind of idea as to where it should not go if you form a bearish view at this point of time one example is you could set this point or you could set this point so let's take this point so one example is you should set this 66 and a half as if it goes above 66 and a half now you can also set this whatever it is you have to set some point but the the wider the further that point is away from the further the stop level is away from the market price where you enter your trade the more you're going to lose more the more you're going to lose if your view is wrong right so you have to adjust that there's a trade off there okay so the point is let's take this so you have taken a view that the crude oil price is going to collapse and so that's why you've hedged your underlying position okay by going short uh, in your hedge book now but at the time that you took your view you also had a view that as a proper disciplined trader should do also set a stop for your view that is a point on the chart where because the market price is sacred okay the market is always right and the market is the king okay so you have to submit to the market that is the way you stay alive in this business if you try to fight the market you will get taken out very quickly so so you have to say that okay if the this is my view but if the market actually goes above 66 and a half then i surrender my view i cancel out my view i no longer have that bearish view is this clear this is how all view taking should be done whenever you have a view you should also identify a stop point beyond which your view is wrong all right that helps you to limit the amount of money you will lose on one particular trade right okay so based on that now the hedging team also the hedging team also has to operate in that manner okay so you take this view and you take the now suppose after you sell and this is your view this is your stop point after you sell the market starts rising instead of falling as you had expected now and it starts rising above this and it goes above 66 and a half it goes up to 71 30 etc looks like it will break even this level now at this point what do you do okay now if now here's where you understand the difference so because your view was clearly wrong okay your bearish view on the crude oil price which led you to enter into the short uh, crude oil uh, position the hedge position which which, which caused you to create a short hedge position in crude oil to protect your underlying long position okay that view is now clearly wrong okay so now you have two options either you do nothing okay uh, you stick with your 858 because one of the other things that makes you sell at 58 is that you think that 58 is a good enough price okay you think that 58 is a good enough price for the business let's say that business is let's say like a saudi kind of uh, low cost production low cost of production business let's say the cost of production is 25 dollars okay in that case if you realize 58 dollars you think okay this is a de decent gross margin okay this is a decent gross margin for us 5880 i'm happy with 5880 
and I'm afraid the price might crash so I'm locking in okay so at this point after so we are looking at the situation where you have gone short at 5880 with a very bearish view but with the idea that this 66 half should not be uh, broken on the top side uh, that would may change your bearish view but now the market has shot up right through this and has gone up to 7180 etc now what do you do so you have two options if your company has forced you to run a static hedge program a static hedging program in that case you can't do anything once you hedge that's it okay so in this case we took the example of uh, hedging the entire position together you in practice you don't have to do the entire position that is your judgment you want to hedge 40 percent 10 percent 15 percent whatever you want to do okay that's based on your view right so whatever you have hedged in a static hedging program once you hedge it that's it you don't touch that hedge anymore because that amount has been locked in at that price okay so you don't uh, you don't uh, you don't uh, do anything anymore okay so um, uh, you don't uh, do any uh, you don't re reverse the hedge transaction okay so is this clear the static hedging program so this would be a matter of company policy okay that uh, whether it's go you're going to run a dynamic hedging program or a static hedging program okay so everyone is clear about static hedging program okay <laughs> right now let's see the dynamic hedging program okay now so suppose we go back to the situation where you went short at 5880 mark this was your stop point 66 half now the market has already gone up to 7180 now you are really worried because uh, you think that this since this has broken this also might break and prices might actually go all the way up to hundred dollars you take a fresh view essentially you, you you basically understand the implications of the break of the 66 and a half okay when you took that's why you have to take your views in a very precise manner okay so now your view is that because of this break now the price is likely to shoot up to hundred dollars a barrel all right and the current price is 71.80 let's say so if that is the case then isn't it better again all hedge decisions are taken based on the assumption that your view is correct okay because that's all you have to go by okay you have to go with your view and that's basically that at the end of the year you'll have a performance evaluation and they'll see that your view taking was not very good or your risk management was not proper so and then you might get fired or whatever but the point is everything is done based on the assumption that your view is correct all decisions are taken taken uh, based on the assumption that your view is correct okay so if if that is the view that it's now going to hundred dollars a barrel and the price is at 71.80 then isn't it better to basically uh, re-hedge at, at to unwind what you did so take a loss on 5880 to in fact you should take it much earlier than 7180 let's say fine you got up to 71 it's broken 66 suppose it happened very rapidly you were not able to uh, monitor it so now 58 to 71 you lose money okay so you're losing money from 58 to 71 which is about say 12 dollars 13 dollars you're losing but then it has the chance to go from 71 to 100 dollars so you what you do is you do a calculation where you see okay i'll take this 10 to 10 12 dollar loss right now and i will re-hedge at 100 dollars so what you do is whatever you sold at 5880 uh, at 5880 there's 2525 contracts you unhedge again okay so you hedged initially initially you hedged you started out with the underlying position so coming back to your question you don't do it together because when you come into the room already you have the underlying positions when you are given the assignment as the hedging team you already have the underlying position so you don't put them on simultaneously okay there's no question of putting them on simultaneously because these positions already exist now now you are hired as a treasurer now you have to manage the risk by uh, judiciously running a hedge book is this clear so there's no question of being put on cemetery that does that answer your question what you were asking yes. okay they're not happening simultaneously all right so now you come in you start monitoring the market so now you sold 25 contracts but now it broke through the 66 half it's a 71 80 so you take a decision to unhedge are you following is everyone following this Kanika, are you following right now you're going to unhedge because you've taken a view that I might as well take the loss between because you sold at 5880 now what are you planning to do you are planning to buy it back at 71 okay at 58 let's say 59 you sold and now you're going to buy it back at 71 so you're going to take that loss okay so this is what is meant by unhedging because initially you hedged 
you started out with the underlying position then your first transaction was a hedge okay now you understand why I say that the, the first transaction reduces the total risk because you started out with 25 contracts of risk 25 long contracts long your under underlying position was 25 contracts long and your first transaction in this case you decided to hedge everything your first transaction was a sale of 25 contracts so your risk position your risk profile the total of the hedge position the hedge book and the underlying book the total of the two when you take the risk on the total of the two it went to zero for crude oil right because you were long 25 contracts you went to short 25 so net position was zero so you reduce the risk can you see that so if you do hedging properly you will see always that that definition is very is always satisfied that the first transaction will always reduce the total risk even if you have not hedged uh, 25 contracts even if you had hedged let's say five contracts even then that statement would be true because your underlying position would be 25 contracts long and your hedge position would be minus 25 uh, minus 5 okay so plus 25 minus 5 becomes plus 20 plus 25 minus 5 is plus 20 so your to total position has your risk has reduced risk has reduced reduction means even 0 0.005 reduction is reduction right so are you following this you see how the definition is always true that the first transaction must reduce the total risk total risk is risk on the underlying positions plus the risk of the hedge positions yes clear yeah so you are saying that can okay, you show the graph please yeah you are saying that uh, we will sell at 58 80s and we will hedge at 71 no 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 when you sell at 58 80 that itself is a hedge because remember your underlying positions already exist that's why it's called a passive risk book without doing anything just by being passive and operating a mining business you are saddled with all these risks you never asked you never wanted to speculate on oil prices or copper prices but because you're running a mining and exploration business you are supposed to carry some inventory at all times like a normal business how it operates and because that inventory is of the kind of uh, you know it's for commodities which are actively traded so the price is being continuously reset set and reset in the market here okay you can see already how it is moving around okay so because of that uh, you are exposed to risks because your inventory valuation can go against you or in your favor right so therefore uh, so against you is the risk part that we talk about so therefore you are exposed to so so you already have position so the moment you do a hedge transaction in which you sell contracts you sell let's say five cr uh, crude oil contracts that transaction itself is a hedge it's a partial hedge because your underlying position is 25 contracts long and you are going a short only five contracts so it's a hedge but it's a partial hedge because it's not a full hedge of 25 contracts. No, but I'm, what I'm asking is that how are you saying that we can buy again at 71? Yeah, so, so that is so. It can even go down? Of course it can go down. There's always a possibility that any, remember any, any decision that you take is always based on your view. Yeah. I mean, it's better to do your your decision making should be based on your view, not on Piyush's view, right? Because you're responsible for your actions, right? So you have to take all your decisions based on your views. Yes. And every view is vulnerable. Every view is fall fallible. That you can see what I told you about Gunlack, also Jeffrey Gunlack, who's a very famous money manager. And he has pretty much been wrong on the bond market for the last almost one year. And he's been wrong on the stock market also. He's been very bearish on the stock market and very bearish on the bond market but the bond market has turned out to be bullish and the stock market has turned out to be bullish so he's actually been wrong he's been consistently wrong but I still want you to study his uh, lectures and, uh, and his uh, analysis because his analysis is very thorough so you will learn how to do a thorough comprehensive analysis by following his uh, method okay but obviously that you have to understand this is what makes this kind of business much more challenging than anything else like you know if you're designing a rocket you know that if you know the science you will have some maybe some problems here there eventually you'll crack it and once you crack it it stays cracked that you don't have to visit that problem again in science this is the advantage right once you've cracked the problem then you know once you know how you how to generate enough force to get out of the earth's orbit 
now they've cracked that problem now you don't have to the further generations don't have to deal with that problem that remains solved there's no such kind of uh, there's no such uh, you know platform to stand on in finance and economics everything is up in the air okay everybody you can see big experts running big huge funds are all wrong okay? because nobody's view is uh, has any guarantee attached to it so yes of course your view can always go wrong the point is that at the same time you do need to decide you need to do something right so you can you need to do something so therefore whatever you do is going to be based on your view is this clear so therefore the first let's understand i'm just coming to the let's first understand this clearly you start out with underlying positions underlying position is long 25 contracts then you enter into a hedge this is a hedge you sell five contracts that's a hedge then it shoots up above your uh, point which you had set as a stop for your view okay you thought 61 40 60 it should not go above 66 40 or whatever okay it goes above that level that 66 50 level now you have changed your view because it goes above this now your new view is that this is going all the way to 100 so what you say is therefore instead of now sitting on this short hedge here i'm going to unhedge so you first you hedge and then you unhedge and you unhedge you understand unhedge means you just uh, re revi reverse that transaction the hedge transaction so your first hedge transaction was sale of five contracts now you're going to unhedge that so you're going to buy back five contracts so the net result is that once again you the net result is basically let's say you do it at 66 and a half so from 5880 to 66 and a half on five contracts you lose okay so which is on 5000 barrels so the loss has to be calculated as each uh, this price is per barrel so you have lost from 6650 minus uh, 5880 times 5000 barrels so that amount you have lost so you eat that loss you crystallize that loss it's a realization of the loss you realize that loss but you why do you realize the loss because you're now your view is that this thing is going to hundred dollars so you think that even if I have to realize a loss on uh, of that amount but it's still better for me to unwind because this thing is going to hundred dollars and then I'll hedge the whole book at hundred dollars this is clear okay so this is called a dynamic hedging program where you are allowed to hedge and unhedge okay so the static program so the, understand that if you are given a dynamic hedging program so all this is all explained in your notes okay everything is explained in detail here types of hedging programs static and he dynamic hedging programs everything is there in your notes okay just try to understand the concept here and then read it later on all right so here understand one thing that the dynamic hedging program does not force you to hedge dynamically you if you have the permission for a dynamic to run a dynamic hedging program from the corporate board and the uh, and the md and all that the corporate pol risk management policy allows you to run a dynamic hedging program you can still choose to run it like a static program that is just a, because that flexibility you have but it doesn't operate the other way if you have the mandate to run only a static program you can't run it like a dynamic program is that clear to everyone yes. yeah so this one is more flexible so you have it just that you have the flexibility to do this so essentially this means that. so which program do you think is more risky for the company so saloni and uh, who else rajan thinks the static is more hectic uh, more uh, more uh, risky and somebody here is saying that dynamic is more risky yeah sorry we didn't even come to your question so dynamic is more risky because you can see here what has happened because as Koshbu pointed out see here what we do is we first go short at 58 then we uh, let's say we do it for the we are doing it for the whole position we go short 25 contracts at 5880 then we have to take a loss at 67 66 half bro we have to take a loss why are we taking this loss because we think it's going to 100 but it may not go to 100 it may drop again it may dramatically drop quickly to 45 all right because again if you see once you say this then if you take a simple trend following view now if you change your view that okay now the market goes above 66 half so you say that now i'm bullish but then after that if the market falls below this 50 dollar level you can see there is a lower low here so if it went up here it would a new it would be a new trend can you see that according to your trend following method you have a low you have a high 
Now if it goes above, you would have a new high. Yes? Are you following this logic? You would have a new high. Now here's one high, there's a new high, here's one low and this would become a new low. Yes? So you would have higher highs, one high higher highs and you would have higher lows. So a new uptrend would have developed. But then again, if this new uptrend develops, which is what makes you bullish thinking that this is going to $100, okay? But if now after going to 70, 75 maybe, it again falls back and falls below 50. Once again, it would destroy this uptrend. Can you see that? Yes? Is everyone in agreement? Shrishti, are you in agreement? If it goes below 50, it would destroy this. May I look at the chart, otherwise you would not understand what is going on. So if it goes above and makes a new high and then you have one high, a higher high, one low, a higher low, a new trend has developed, a new uptrend has developed. <coughs> but then after going here, as Skushbu pointed out, there is a risk of course that if you unwind your position, if you unhedge, then again it can drop down and break below 50. <laughs> Nothing is guaranteed. Okay, anything can happen. So once again, if it breaks below 50, again your view is destroyed. Okay, so when you took the view that this was going to 100, the stop for that view should have been $50. Yes, everyone follows the logic, right? Okay, so in this case, therefore, uh, again, so now what can happen is you lose. Why is this dynamic hedging program more risky? You just ate a loss of about uh, $8 or something. Okay, 8 to $9. Now, again, after going to 71, it, it, it again falls back and goes below 70. Now, whatever you bought at uh, the 66 $67, again, you have to sell that at $50. So, again, you realize a loss of $17 per barrel. So, in this manner, the market can keep going up and down. All right, and you can keep adjusting your view and adjusting your hedge position and you could end up losing a lot more money. Okay, so in general that dynamic hedging program is much more risky because in a static program you just lock it in once there is very little risk because you have now already reduced your risk to zero because in what you are doing in a static program I'm just coming to you there on one sec. So I'm uh, in a static program what you are doing is you're just hedging once and forgetting about it. So your underlying position goes from uh, whatever it is 25 contracts if you hedge the full thing it goes to zero right. Okay, so we are already over the time, so uh, you, I'll dismiss the class. But Tarun, you, you can ask your question. Uh, so rest of you can go. Please revise all this stuff and make sure you understand. Concept should be hundred percent clear. Okay. Kanika, revise all this stuff so that you are able to answer the question properly. Yeah. Sir, you are saying that number 58, we are rich. At 66, you are saying that we are Yeah. And then we lost. Yeah. Because what is your, what is the, I mean, the hedging transaction is a sale? The hedging transaction is a sale of the uh, sale. Yeah. But sir, the uh, underlying asset also, uh, it's, it's this, it is long. Yeah. And the price is going up. So from there, you are getting profit. You are getting a profit there, yes, okay. But the point is, this loss is a realized loss. Okay, this is realized, that is So you have a cash, the realized losses are a problem because these are cash losses. You have to fund it. It's cash output. Yeah, so it's a cash output. There's a realized cash output. So that's why it's a problem. That's why you can say that this is loss. Yeah. Whereas it is not a loss. Yeah, you can say that, yeah, underlike, yeah. Then I think, but these are cash losses. Yeah. So therefore, they are treated as a. Any time we unhedge, it's not actually a loss to the company. Yes, but but what happens once more is see what happens to your risk. See, if you are long 25, uh, if you are long 25 contracts, underlying position, okay. Now you go short 25 here. Your net position has gone to zero. Okay. Now what is what has happened is once it goes to 66 half, you have unwound your hedge. So your net position is back to plus 25. No, but now we are short to zero. No, we are short to zero. No, you are not shorting. Okay, you are. No, no. What you are doing is you went short here, and we say so. We are going short. Yeah. So in at 5880, you went short futures 25 contracts. Okay. Your underlying position was already long 25 contracts. Right? 
So at this point, when you went short 25, your net position is zero, right? Plus 25 minus 25. But once it goes above this, you go and buy back. So you unwind the head. Underlying we don't underline becomes exposed again. Yeah. Okay. So now it is on the risk to get down. Once again, there is a risk. Okay. Yeah. And this loss is also important because to focus on it as a loss because these are cash losses. So when you are running a program, you need to have a budget if you are running a dynamic heading program. You need to have a budget for these cash losses. Yeah. Same kind of. It becomes like an active program. Yeah. It's just that we are hedging on future contracts. Yeah. And now we have to calculate it on the basis of the future, like on hedging positions and not on other. Yeah. Same. The loss calculation is same. Yeah. Yeah. So the point is basically this is the reason this is important to treat it as a loss is because these are cash losses and you have to have a funding in your account because you have to pay this money. So when you are running a dynamic hedging program, you will have to take all this into account. You will need to have a budget for your uh, hedge, uh, dynamic hedging program losses. You have to have a loss budget for that and then accordingly you will have to hedge even the size of the position has to be adjusted based on the same logic will come into play as underlying position as the those of you who are not for underlying position but that basically is, like you know, uh, for this we will be hedging the same uh, position size that we are going on underlying if we are on 25 contracts underlying then we will hedge for 25 more because we are assuming so this position size doesn't come from system edge calculation no that's what i'm saying so the position size so we have no you are going a little bit far ahead we have not gone into the discussion if you see in the case one of the questions is one of the questions is what happens to the generic decision problems yeah so you will see that one of your your position size is automatically solved it's solved because in a range okay maximum position size gets automatically solved because you can't sell more than 25 yeah. That's the so we will see there is also something called minimum, but maximum is done. yeah so the maximum position size gets solved so those positions so that's where you see there's a difference in a hedging context between how uh, between the uh, hedging position and a uh, uh, or class hai so it's off the view so uh, that's the thing so uh, then so we'll come to that discussion later. question yeah yeah Static, you say that we come down, come down to zero in dynamic, we can, if we are uh, bearing a loss and we are coming down to 50, we can unhedge again. Huh? So why is more riskier than static? That's why. No, because you can end up with a lot of cash. See, first thing you can see straight away is based on what I just told Tarun, that when you, let's say you have 100, you have 25 contracts underlying position. At this point, you go short 25. So your net position is zero, right? Now, once the market rises above 66, let's say you go to 67. So from 58 to 67, you unwind the because the market has broken this high. All right, a new uptrend has developed. So you unwind. So now you become bullish. Why did you go short on the hedge book? Because you were bearish. Now your view has changed. You become bullish. All right. So when you become bullish, you go long again. So if you're going long, essentially what you're doing is your net position becomes long because the short position of 25 contracts on the hedge book, you unwind that. You reverse it. So you buy back 25 contracts on say six at say 68 or whatever. Okay. So 58 to 68, you lose ten dollars per barrel into 25 contracts, which means 25,000 barrels. Okay, you lose that money. That's a direct cash loss. That's a realized loss. Okay, you have to fund that loss. You have to pay that money to the exchange, right? And the winner will get that money. So therefore, this is important to budget for this kind of losses. So now, and now see what has happened to your position. Not only did you realize a loss, now see what's happened to your total position. What is your total position now? Your total position started out as plus 25. Then you sold 25 on the hedge book. So it was minus 25. So net total position was zero. Now after you have unwound your hedge completely, what is your total position now? Plus 
plus there is already plus 25 that you are not touching then here you went minus 25 so then it became net zero but now here you have gone to minus 25 has been cancelled so you go plus or minus 25 you do plus 25 so the hedge book goes to zero the total position is always the sum of the hedge book positions and the underlying positions so if you if you sell 25 contracts here and you buy back 25 contracts here all this activity is happening on the hedge book so the net hedge book position is now zero yes no first agree whether or not if you sell 25 contracts here all the transactions remember you can't touch the underlying positions right you are only allowed to run a parallel hedge book which is trying to offset the losses on the underlying which you you are forecasting losses based on what you think is going to happen to the market right so you are running a parallel hedge book on the hedge book you go short 25 minus 25 but once it goes here you go plus 25 because you want to unwind that position so from mine you started out on the hedge book as minus 25 now you buy it back so you do plus 25 so hedge book position is zero now yes again apply the same formula total position is equal to underlying position plus hedge positions so what is the total position now <laughs> no, 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 one minute. Let us do it on this uh, spreadsheet. <laughs> now you are maybe getting. Uh, that's why you are confused. Okay. That's why you should revise the video. No? Underlying position. Okay. Uh, let's call this underlying position. Let's call this hedge position. Okay. So underlying position is 25. No. Let's have this as uh, so we'll have this as the total. And this is your total position. Okay. This is this plus this. Yes. Okay. So you start out with underlying position of 25. So your total position is 25. Then in the hedge, you take a view on the oil price, you become very bearish. You go short oil, you hedge the entire position. So hedge position, you create a minus 25 contract hedge position. So total position goes to zero. Yeah. Now, when the market, the crude oil uh, price shoots up after you go short, breaks your stop level and goes up. So 68, you at this point, you are no longer bearish. You become bullish. So why should you maintain a short position on the hedge book? if your view is bullish if your view is bullish you should be long or you should be square okay so what you do is since you can't go net long on the hedge book okay so therefore what you do is here you therefore what you do you have a short position but your view has now become bullish so you buy back contracts you buy 25 contracts you sold 25 so your position went to minus 25 now you're bullish you buy back those contracts so so you buy 25 now your hedge position is zero yes so what is happening in the total position it's not zero it's 25 yes so now this is the so the reason we say the dynamic hedging program is more risky is that first of all now after hedging now what might happen is now you have gone long at 25 you've gone again the underlying position has become exposed okay it's as if now you're long at the new price 68 dollars okay where you un un unhedged at this price now the underlying position essentially is long here okay now again the market might drop okay after this when you go unwind as soon as you unwind the market might drop so you'll suffer a further loss here okay so therefore this is the position has become more exposed the position has become more exposed and then on top of that the you have realized the cash loss this loss has to be funded you need to have uh, in the hedging program you need to have a budget for this loss 
this is just like your risk capital for your previous products. I mean, a, a speculative book, when you're running a speculative book, you need a budget for risk capital, how much money you can afford to lose. So you need a similar budget. And not only that, that budget has to be uh, also accounting for the possible losses on the underlying positions. So there's a separate loss budget for cash losses. And here also there has to be a budget. So it's more, it becomes more complicated if you run uh, an active trading book. And it's more risky because you can uh, generate these additional cash losses which you don't have in a static program once you hedge it you're stuck it. Yeah. yeah in a static program you don't unhedge so whatever it is okay you lock in your uh, realization at 58 dollars and even if the market goes higher fine you you don't do anything about it okay that's like an opportunity loss uh, first, uh, first, like we are at zero. If we are hedging, if we are long, so we are getting 25 plus 25 on cash and minus. If we are short, so there will be zero. Yeah, in a in a active in a, in a active trading program, in a static hedging program, this second hedge transaction is not allowed. So you go long, you have long position, you start with long positions, then you go short in the hedge book, and that's it. Your net position goes to zero. Okay. All right. So. No, 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 there's no, there's, no, 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 this is because uh, people use the word hedging just like they use the word arbitrage. They use the word hedging also in a loose way without understanding the correct meaning of hedging. The correct meaning of hedging is what I've taught you that a, a hedge transaction, a hedger's uh, transactions, okay, will always reduce the first transaction, has to reduce the total risk. See here your total risk was initially suppose you don't have this so even if you sold one contract the total position is 25 now total position goes to 24 so your risk has reduced so if you are running a proper hedge book for a hedger the first transaction in a financial market will reduce the total risk okay so this is always true so that whatever you read you can send the link to me whatever you read, you read it on the internet right send me the link okay but that definition they use the word hedging in a loose way a lot of people use it in a loose way because just like arbitrage people don't understand these concepts properly they just throw words around okay so that's the problem that's why we are saying that there is a separate class of people who are speculators and that's why we said in the market there are uh, three types of players speculators arbitragers and hedgers okay? so mostly they are either going to be speculators or hedgers there are a few arbitragers in the market so but hedging is also hedges are also a legitimate category of person just think of a wheat farmer now the CME you can get wheat futures also okay so a wheat farmer farmer will look at wheat prices and what is a wheat farmer he is farming wheat so if you look at wheat prices I'm sure you can get wheat prices here yeah. you can look at wheat prices weekly wheat prices see if you are a wheat farmer all right and you're planting crops now if the price drops like from here to here wouldn't you have liked to be able to hedge your wheat crop at these high levels right and then when the market because if you don't hedge then the market drops here then your realization is much less so hedging is also a legitimate activity right? it's a legitimate business activity so even in a country like india which is very backward and very uh, uh, anti-free market even in india hedging is not banned <laughs> hedging is allowed for but in fact what the corporate uh, banks try to reserve bank tries to do is make sure that you're only hedging and you don't speculate if you have a hedger's profile okay so that's what they, they try to cut down on speculation but they don't have ban so it's very unlikely that any country will ban hedging in the true sense so that term they may have used in a you can send me the link i'll tell you what it what it's uh, where it's made a mistake is this clear so you can see here volatility of wheat prices also if you have so this is also a legitimate this is why the u.s futures markets really started for these agricultural products wheat those who are farming cattle you have cattle prices also okay? because they have beef cattle in the u.s so they have cattle prices they have pig prices so uh, all this stuff is meant to protect these guys to so basically give these guys see think of our farmers we don't have well developed 
develop futures market. So our farmers don't have any opportunity to hedge. They should actually have the opportunity because the wheat farmer who can hedge at these high prices is able to lock in a nice profit that is good for him next year. He can invest more in capital goods, things like that. So these people should be given that opportunity.